Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone across the globe. Welcome to the IORG-sponsored webinar, an email love fest. JK, just kidding. Indeed, today's Wall Street Journal, there's an article describing how stress may increase workplace productivity. However, I suspect most of us have experienced decreases in productivity from frequent frustrations and distractions from email. Today, we're honored to offer the views of three panelists, all of whom are internationally recognized experts on zero email. They have personally migrated from email to other communication channels and have counseled others on this transformation. Let me take a moment just to describe our format. After I share the backgrounds of the panelists, each panelist would share their views. During the switching between the three panelists, we will offer two interactive polls. Uh, related to your email experiences. After the panelist's personal remarks are completed, we'll entertain your questions and answers. Please send your questions to me anytime during the webinar, and after the panelists are done, I will forward these uh, for their responses. Your audio is muted. Uh, the question and answer box is in the lower right-hand corner that you can send your questions to me anytime. Uh, now I'll introduce the panelists to you. Robert Shaw was appointed CEO of Blue Kiwi in April 2013, bringing 20 years of experience working with international organizations. Prior to Blue Kiwi, Robert was Global Program Director of the award-winning ATO Zero email program, responsible for deploying Blue Kiwi across 74,000 employees in 42 countries. Robert was previously responsible for implementing ATO strategic programs within the UK and Ireland and also has been a senior commercial and business transformation roles with ATOS. Before joining ATOS in 2005, Robert was a consultant at IBM and PricewaterhouseCoopers, having started his business career as a management trainee with Unilever. Uh, Luis Suarez is a seasoned social business an evangelist and 2.0 practitioner working as the lead social business enabler at IBM for W3 Connections and IBM.com Connections with over 16 years of experience on knowledge management, collaboration, learning, online communities, and social networking for business along with open business and has been living for the past five years the corporate world without email challenging the status quo of how knowledge workers collaborate and share their knowledge by promoting openness, transparency, trust, sustainable growth, engagement, and connectedness in overall smart work. Paul Jones is director of ibiblio.org, clinical professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications, and clinical professor of the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Professor Jones blogs about research on, opinions of, and work for better communication strategies and services. This is going to be, I'm sure, a real treat because everyone is very, very interested in looking for solutions and how to transform themselves, perhaps, from email to uh, using uh, more productive and better communication channels. So now I'll turn this over to Robert to let him uh, share his experiences with you. Thank you, Marty. And I don't know if it's possible to give me control so I can share some slides with our audience here. That's great. So thank you to everybody for joining this call. It's wonderful to have allies on this journey. And the journey for Atos is one we believe is blazing a path for a new way of working in the workplace. Atos is the eighth largest IT service organization in the world. It has 74,000 employees in 48 years. We run critical IT infrastructure for all organizations around the world in every business sector. Our journey is one of social collaboration. It started inspired 
a concept called well-being at work. And well-being at work is at the heart of our management philosophy. Alongside customer focus and operational effectiveness. Our well-being at work activities are coordinated primarily by young employees who are given permission, official sanction, to be disruptive in their thinking. And they noticed, as I suspect on this call has noticed, a tendency towards email overload and documented that overload. They email is interfering with the well-being of our employees. So, for example, more than our, half of our employees who are spending more than a day managing their inbox. And when we look at the content of that inbox where it was legal to do so, we were able to ascertain that a significant proportion, up to 70%, was not related to their daily activities. So our chief executive listened to us and made a statement that was very radical and in fact caught the imagination of the world. It said that within three years, and this was back in February 2011, Atos would become a pro email company. Now, of course, he was noting the information overload. And at that stage, there were a number of visionaries, perhaps the Zero Year Movement, and you have two leading exponents on this call uh, aside from me. At this stage, I was merely a, a, an apparatchik within a large organization. So uh, I wasn't part of the visionary movement. But I was amongst employees listening to this announcement and wondering how we were going to do it. As, by the way, with 3.5 other people who wants to find out because they have a page on Google. Captured the attention of the world. So the aim was to create a program. What was that program focused on? Well, in many ways, it was focused on etiquette, on finding better ways to communicate, on helping our employees manage their information. However, our attention began to focus on social media. Why? Because that generational group noticed that in the outside world, in the world before they joined the workplace, media was their prime mode of communication when they each other physically. And they noted that coming in operation like ours at that time, they had to learn how to use email as a mode of communication and they found it quaint and antiquated. So our focus, our search began for social software that would allow our employees to collaborate. So a combination of email reduction through better content, plus a search for appropriate collaborative solutions and new ways of working, what Atos believes will lead to the zero email company. And that search led to a software selection, in our instance, focused on Blue Kiwi. And Blue Kiwi is organization were able to modify an amend development path to bring mature features of collaboration specifically designed for the workplace in a way that addressed an academic paper, a paper called the Zero Email Company, which was the Atos point of view of how we would do this. Now I will not go through because we need to and to the other speakers on this call, the rationale behind zero email. But there are many studies, and the one I will come to 
to you is the 2010 McKinsey survey, which articulates the business benefits of social media, and we believe certainly that we will see benefits within Atos. Our program is structured on four areas, not just the interpersonal behavior, but focusing in on business processes. We believe that the best business processes run with their end workflow, and the email is a sign of efficient, of inefficient, and is often a sign of a broken process. Clearly, we have a mission to roll out social software, and our Blue Kiwi deployment, as we stand today, has hit the 36,000 mark. So when we look at the addressable population, the component population within Atos that use email, we're over the halfway point. And we're now looking at the quality of interaction in the 1,600 communities that now exist within our business. Clearly that requires a significant change program, educate our workforce, new ways of working, how do they break out of the email cycle? How do they learn new ways of working and do that in a way that doesn't leave their email out of control? So we've developed methods principally focused on onboarding teams by community. That means that no one is behind in any community or group and there is all peer pressure to change at the point of the channel switch. And lastly, what gets measured gets done. And so it's important, again, where legal to do so, that we're able to measure both the adoption of social networking, the quality of social networking, and its salary, the reduction in email, which we believe is a lagging indicator of social adoption. Now, at this point, I would happily go through into further details, but I think given the nature of this call and the time we have, it would be fairer if I handed over the microphone to the other contributors. And if you wish to question me, I'm happy to go deeper into our story and explain what we're doing, how we are doing it, and the success that we had. So thank you very much for listening to that brief introduction at us zero email story. And Marty, if I can hand it back to you so that you can introduce the other speakers. Luis, uh, we'll let you uh, share your story from IBM and other places. Can you guys hear me again now? All right. Well, thank you. Well, hi, and welcome, everyone. And thanks, Marty, for the invitation to participate on the panel. Um, following further on on what Robert mentioned about that particular journey um, on reducing your dependency on, on your in inbox clutter, I wanted to add further up onto the practical side of how it actually works out. And in principle, I don't have any slides to show. I think that it, it will work better in terms of showing a little bit of the story of how I started it, why I started it, and explain a little bit of the implications in the context of information overload, of how five years ago I, I decided that I had enough with uh, my email box. I felt that I was no longer being productive enough. I felt that um, it was more uh, having a sense of, of doing someone else's work as, as a delegation machine, and how in most cases it wasn't even a proper... A collaboration tool because of, of the various different private interactions that were happening where there was no visibility and there were no there was no easy way to manage the flow and and perhaps the main aspect is is along the lines of, of today's discussion in terms of information overload is that I have always believed that email is perhaps one of our biggest productivity drains in terms of how much unnecessary traffic we generate through email that when you move it actually in an, in an open context in, in, in the terms of, of social networks, the vast majority of that volume disappears. 
And I do want to make a distinction here because I know that at this point in time, some of you may be thinking, like, hang on for a second, but if we go and look into the social networking tools out there, there is certain information overload in there. Um, I can certainly agree with that sentiment. And the reason why that is happening is because there's that nature of oversharing that we're going through, right? Like everyone wants to be known by everyone. That's exactly what happens on all the social networking tools out there on the social web. However, if you move that into the context of internal collaboration, uh, the vast majority of you that may be already familiar with uh, some sort of social networking platform, whatever it may well be, you can see how that sense of oversharing is not there. Um, and, and, and that explains as well, the re and I will explain the reasons why probably when we go into the, 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 the Q&A itself. But in terms of the, the information overload, I think that one of the issues that we have been having with email is that we keep using email as a way to justify our work, to justify in terms that if it doesn't happen through email, it just does not exist. And that means that I have to, every, every single task, I need to justify it. And how I justify it? Well, I justify it with using CC, the CC field or the BCC field, or just delegating the work onto someone else and washing my hands and wait for it to come back and all cleared, or just basically engaging in silly political or bullying games of trying to show how entitled you are, how empowered you are, based on whatever position or authority you have, right? Now, um, like I said before, five years ago, I had enough of that. And I decided to um, throw myself into Lions, as I call it, and I decided to challenge a corporation like IBM with 450,000 people um, in 170 countries in 2,000 locations and say, from now onwards, I'm not going to be using email to work and to justify my work. And instead, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using social networking tools. Now, I know that uh, you all may be thinking, like, hang on for a second. Uh, it's great that you're doing that, but isn't it the situation where if your colleagues don't stop using email, you will still have to go and continue using email like they do? Say, so, yes, that's absolutely right. So my key message here is that if you want to reduce your inbox clutter, you will have to help educate your teams that you work around it to also walk away from your inbox, right? And later on, Paul will be sharing a lot of really good practical advice on how you can actually make it happen based on his own experiences as well. The interesting thing here is that if you actually challenge the status quo, how things run, no matter how large the corporation, you will eventually make it happen. Now, the reason why I don't have any slides and I want to show this particular website is that this particular website was created three years after I started the, the actual movement. And I started it as a one-man show, and that website right now is a pan-European social business campaign from IBM for the Collaboration Solutions Group. So I became all of a sudden their public avatar. Uh, how did that happen? Traction. How did that happen with patience, with resilience, with teaching and showing and educating each and every one of those people that I was working with that if they wanted to become more collaborative, more open, and more engaging in how they were working, we needed to find a better way. And that better way was through social networking tools. You may be wondering, okay, so how do you do it? And, and I'm going to go and briefly give you some hints as to how I do it and then we can move into Paul with, with all of the various different tips that he's got as well to add. So the, way I, the, first thing, the first thing that I do is I challenge how people work and in terms of how they use email. So if I see a better way of working, I will go and suggest it. And typically what they will tell me, well, I don't know how to use that tool. So my answer back is, don't worry, I'll show you. I'll prefer to spend now five minutes to show you how to address a particular issue than having to spend hours cleaning up my inbox, right, or trying to find that email or trying to back up my email data or whatever else, right? So the way I do it and, and the way it works for me is that um, I come up with a good number of various different use cases of how people actually interact today through email. So there are people who leave an email to share status project reports, to share newsletters, to share news and announcements, to ask questions, to answer questions, to share files, to share links, to eventually... Uh, uh, tell their colleagues what they're working on, right? Sort of like narrating their work, except that the audience is a lot smaller and closed and private. So people use email for all those various different use cases. I actually have got a methodology, which I'm about to share in the next uh, week or two, that I have collected 40 different use cases of how people use email and how each and every one of those interactions can actually be moved into social networking tools. Uh, so what I do then is I map that exercise of what is the use case and then I move it into the social component. So, for instance, as an example, 
a status project report can be shared as a blog post or as a wiki page, depending on which which of the two people are more comfortable with. File sharing, right? Instead of doing attachments, and, and you guys will have a case with when Paul mentions attachments, uh, they should go into a social file sharing space, right? Uh, links, they should go into social bookmarks, right? Personal reflections in terms of starting a conversation instead of the reply to all, they can have a place in a blog. So that's what I meant with, you know, figuring out what the use cases, how you can map them into the specific social networking tool and then move one of those interactions at a time where you can actually educate the teams that you work with to make the move. Now, how is that going to reduce information overload? Well, as a starting point, it's going to help in a couple of different elements. Number one is that you will reduce a lot of the frictions. A lot of the term, a lot of the email that we generate is in terms of asking people, you know, where do I find this information? How do I find this expert? How do I go and report this into the project, right? Now, if you adopt that mentality of narrating your work, of working out loud, as it is well known in the world of social, what you're doing there is you reduce the need to report. Actually, you kill it. Why? Because if you connect with your immediate teams as part of those networks, they will see exactly what you're doing when you will want to share it. Right? So there's a lot less friction in there, and it will become a lot more focused. It will also reduce the information overload because you will get rid of the useless conversations that are happening in the corporate world that keep dragging in terms of antiquated uh, business processes or people who just basically want to drag you along with them into their way of working because that's how they feel they're productive and that's not how they feel you're productive. So all of that politics, all of that bullying that happens in terms of, you know, uh, one of your fellow colleagues seeing your boss and your boss's boss and your executive about something that you may not have done, all of that disappears. When you move those conversations out in the open, people can see that. And that's when obviously you will do is, is you will have to nurture your networks in terms of how you can open up and become more collaborative to provide an environment where people trust each other, where people help each other instead of fighting with one another. One of the things that I have seen, and I'm going to finish off with that, and this is an experiment that I did based on, um, on a research that McKinsey did as well in 2011, where they were actually querying corporate America in terms of, of how were people's habits. And one of the interesting data that came out of that was the fact that um, an, average of, uh, uh, an average knowledge worker, so all of us, would have spent up to 650 hours per year just doing email. Right? So that's roughly around three months. So right now, three months, you're doing just that email. Now, I know that you guys don't check email when you're on vacation, so I will not add that month extra. But those of you who do, you will have to add another month extra. That's four months out of the year that you're doing email. Right? Now, last year, as I said before, I did um, an experiment to, to corroborate actually how much time I would have spent on social networks versus email. So I actually timed myself every time that I was doing internal social networking to get my work done. And instead of those 650 hours per year, which was roughly the three months, I actually ended up with 35 days, so five weeks. That's what it actually t takes me to go and get through my work using social networking tools because of that reduction in information overload, because of that particular uh, reduction in friction, and because of that unnecessary volume of email that I no longer have to handle it. Right. So obviously... I can be more productive, twice more productive than the average knowledge worker by having faster access to the information, but most importantly, faster access to experts who have the knowledge that I need to get my job done without having to fight them, but we are actually with the nature of helping them. So when people tell me, okay, so what you have done is you have moved just conversations from your inbox into social networking tools, I don't see the value. Well, that's the value. That's the return on investment for me that I have been able to save two times more time that I was doing before when I was doing email. And that, for a power user as I am, in, in, in the sense of you know, being a social computing evangelist for 12 years already, so having rather large, powerful networks. So people with a smaller network, the benefits are even larger than that. I have got a number of very different fellow colleagues who are doing experiments and trying to reduce in their inbox clutter as well. And they have been confirming how they can actually accelerate that same pace just as much as, as me, if not more, with the reduced network, networks as well. So the key messages here that we want to leave you guys before I, I hand it over to Paul is essentially keep challenging the status quo. If email doesn't work for you, go and fight it. Find a better venue for it. There's a great chance that social networking, networking tools will do it. And then educate the colleagues around you. If you want to go out of your inbox, you need to get your team out of your inbox. If not, you won't do it. 
And the final tip, start with one use case per week. Start easy, start small, build from there. So um, I think I'm ready now to go and hand it over to Paul, Paul Jones. So Paul, if you want to take it over, and then we can go later on for the turns of questions. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, welcome, and I want to add uh, a little bit to build on Robert and on uh, Luis's uh, work. I've been without email uh, for two years. I'll talk about how to get there, but I first thought I'd address part of what Robert said in, about why we're here. First, we're here because we're in a war with robots. We're in a war with two different kinds of robots and with people that act like robots. The first robots, we are well known. They're evil robots. They send spam. We use all kinds of filters, enemies lists, Gmail, others to try and block those robots. And we're still maybe, even if we're 90% effective, still a large percent of what ends up in our inbox are evil robots. Then there are well-intentioned robots, those that send you alerts, they are newsletters, they want a special offer for a hotel you stayed in two years ago and suddenly got on their list. These kind of things that want to help you out, but you really might want that information, you don't want it there. The next are people that act like robots. They CC everybody. They reply all. They send you evil attachments. So in, where real people have real requirements, but in my analysis of what I was getting, even as a college professor who could get a lot of communications, I, that's often less than 1% of my inbox. We started out using machines to communicate, and now the machine sends you email, and you spend your time sorting it. And even people that use it are spending time calling up, did you get my email? Didn't I see get this from you? And there, it's become it, a, literally a joke. And there's only one thing worse than email on its own, and that's attachments. And I'm certain, I'm certain when the Buddha thought to warn us of attachment that exactly what he thought was a PDF. But we may have had a love affair with email. In my case, it was in the 1980s when I actually brought email to the UNC campus in a broad way, and I developed uh, email programs. I went around and evangelized people to give, away, give up their inner office memos and move to email. But there are times that you just need to give it up. But luckily, there's some trend going on. Now, Pew notices here in going up through 1911 that email and searching are pretty standard for what people do on the Internet. But there's something about this chart that Pew talks about less but is more important, and that's the growth of social networking sites. Not, and what is also not measured are social alternatives to email other things that do what email does yet better. But when you break this down in a further demographic that reflects Robert's experience, we see email dying at the below age 45. That this group in the U.S. has really does not like email, does not want to do email, and has sought out alternatives to email. The people solidly in the email column are those at mid to end career. They're really not our future. This is where Roberts brought in young disruptors, but what I call the six ages of email happen. People under 16 don't use it. I'll talk more about this soon. Those under 25 think email is, that's what you talk to the man. I deal with people under 25 for a large part of my life, and many of them have given their university email passwords to their parents. And I ask them, why did you do this? Why would you give away your email? And they went, well, I have my email that I've had since middle school 
BarkleyUnicorn65 at Yahoo.com. But, and my friends, if they need to send me email, we'll send it there. But really, we're on Tumblr, we're on Snapchat, we text, we do other things. And the only email that I get is from the university administrators. And I would just forward that to my parents anyway. So why shouldn't I just let them have it? Uh, after they get out and get jobs, they use email at work because their boss tells them to. But they're tremendous side channels of conversation generally going on in text or alternative social networking. When I talked and interviewed people in the 35 to 50 range, they went, you know, I'm really trying hard to get on top of this, to be the man, to run the company. And actually, women tell me they're the man, too, in this case. The man is a construct, as you probably know. Uh, then at about age 50, they are the man. And they, they don't really want to learn anything new. It's really a challenge for, for those people to decide to be fresh. That's not to say there aren't people that want to be that way. And then, of course, we return to our native state as we retire. And what's email? Who needs it? The real interesting study follow-on is the trends for teens. Notice that more teens talk on the landline in the U.S. per day than exchange email daily. The upside to part of this is that 35% of emails, uh, uh, pardon me, of teens actually interact with human beings in person. But there's a little more to this in waiting. Texting is the dominant teen communication form. And anyone who's a parent of teens there knows that if you call your teens, they're going to text you back. That is, if they even notice that you've called. Texting dominates in the U.S. to an extent that adults know but often don't acknowledge and don't see moving up into the entering the workforce stage so that anybody just about 35 and under text is a default, highly integrated part of their life of communication. Overall, 75% of all teens text, and of that whole number of all teens, 65% use text to communicate with others. Going back, remember, 6% exchanged emails. Oops, sorry. So um, what I'd like to go through next are what is better. And what is better is not just an email replacement. It's just, that's just replacing IM, uh, taking IM or Chatter or Twitter and saying that replaces everything. The context needs to be appropriate. And also, it needs to be mobile. New workers don't want to be at a workstation. If they're stationary, they feel like they're not working. There's a lot of analysis on that. And unless you're stuck in a call center or stuck in some sort of job where you do have to, mobile is preferred. Also, formality is less important. People would like to get what they want. The next one, which is important to us in keeping the inbox empty, are whitelist. And if you think of the most of the social stuff that we've talked about, it's really whitelisting those activities, taking out the kind of random stuff that comes in. And as Luis has made a very, very strong case for, it should be collaborative. If you can't collaborate, if you can't work in the open, then even within your corporation, you've got a problem. It should be social so that there's less work done by a romantic, strong individual, but as a stronger group, who can carry and augment the work of all the individuals that's in that, or in that group. It should be highly interactive. That generally means fast. If you ask anybody under 35, is email fast, or do any study of 
business exchange. Email is a 2.5 day wait, in, according to most studies. Uh, it should also be on all devices. That generally means in the cloud. If you saw the young woman releasing the heart-shaped balloon, she, and that's one releasing, to me, releasing something that she had loved and now has to give up. But it also means sending it into the clouds so that it's accessible to you wherever you are on whatever device in an easy and smart way. A personal device that you fit in your pocket is great. And integrated uh, communication streams. So that means how do you keep up with LinkedIn, Google+, Twitter, phone, and text. I have all of that integrated on the iPhone through the stream of notifications and alerts, and I don't have to go to a single app to deal with it unless I really want to. So we're stepping definitely in that direction, in that kind of integrative solution we're seeing coming in Facebook, in Google+, and from offerings from Salesforce, and probably we'll see something attempted to do it uh, by Microsoft. There are some other alternatives that we haven't talked about that I thought I'd bring out. Luis uh, talked about um, social bookmarking, but I'd also like to talk about there's still listservs you need to be on. There's still things you'd like. You just don't want them in your inbox. And you can subscribe to most listservs with an RSS feed, and that's a great way to do it. Feedly is one that I like that lets me manage all of the – I'm in two different departments, two different schools at the University of North Carolina, plus I have some other projects that are outside of the schools. I subscribe to things there, but I have them all sorted. They're all there. I can see and prioritize or see whatever list that I want, and it does some of the sorting for me. We run a, what is one of the law, oldest websites in, in North America and one of the oldest web hosting places. Among other things, we invented streaming radio. And so we have a couple of thousand customers. It's not as big as these other guys, but I'm constantly looking for how can I turn it around to understand how to answer questions better. And answering the questions from our customers, our clients, in the open is a great way to do it. And so we replace trouble tickets with a product called Answer Hub, but there are a number of other things like Get Satisfaction that do this, that let your customers post and see the status of all the questions that are there, search for it, and get their answers back. Some of you who are in technology are familiar with Stack Overflow, which provides exactly that same kind of service. Although I haven't moved all of my colleagues to no email, I have at least gotten rid of exchanging email to do meetings or to arrange special events. And doodle.com is probably the best out there for that. It's simple. It does what you want to do. It can link to your various calendars if need be, and you can get it all done. I am fairly radical in some of the things that I do, so my calendar is completely open to anybody who can find it, and my students uh, book meetings with me in meeting spaces that I make available on Google Calendar. Uh, Google Docs I use for collaboration. I've written several chapters of books that way. I've done interviews with opensource.com and other places in that way, and it's a great way to collaborate. How do you log on to devices without an email address? Well, now you may have known any commercial thing you go to basically has something like OpenID that verifies for you. And uh, we talked about ShareFile, which I, I mean um, SharePoint, which is my least favorite of the file sharing environments, but Dropbox, uh, ShareFile, et cetera, those, those provide that same kind of service. Um, I know I've gone through things a little bit fast, so I'm right here uh, on the last slide, and this tells you where the slide is, slides are in tiny URL. Uh, you should be able to find it quickly, and I'm small Jones on both social networks. Thanks a lot, and we're up for the poll and the discussion, I think, at this point.
Thank you, Paul. Thank all of you. Uh, these were really extraordinary insights uh, sharing with us. I have not seen, unless Charlie, I've missed them, any uh, questions from any of the participants. We don't have much time, but I certainly encourage you to uh, send any questions. Let me just uh, make a quick comment, thinking about the whole uh, framework related to moving away from email, it almost sounds like we should be adopting a Six Sigma approach where we have lean, not mean, but lean and meaningful uh, email, sorry, not email, whoops, <laughs> uh, lean and meaningful uh, communications uh, avoiding uh, email uh, as a channel. I was just curious, Paul, when you were mentioning the age factor, which we're all certainly familiar with, <clears throat> A question for all the panelists, uh, certainly something that helps move transformation in organizations is significant senior management support. Uh, it certainly seemed like an Atos that was there. And I'm just wondering, at least at IBM, if uh, there was, you were really moving from bottom up, which was a tremendous effort. I'm just wondering if there was senior management support at IBM or if there's anything happening at UNC along these lines. So, um, the way U.S. universities, especially public universities, work is uh, nobody really answers to anyone quite. Um, we have an official, as you might guess, uh, university policy, and uh, I've, I've had support, although uh, I will say in, in one case a little begrudgingly, uh, by one uh, one of my deans uh, said, this is a, a wonderful idea. Several people have said basically the quote that I had, I wish I could do that, but I'm the man. And uh, my students had no problem with it. The largest problem is uh, because we're all independent entities, uh, different colleagues have their own ways of doing things. For example, I have one colleague who doesn't have a cell phone. Uh, which is a significant outlier. I like to think, as I tell her, you're, she's at one end of outlier, she's up and I'm at another. Okay. Marty, Marty, from, to, from, a, oh, from, from an Atos point of view, from an Atos point of view, I think that Paul's categorization of the generations in the workplace is incredibly instructive. It's not enough, actually, to have a CEO um, set of vision, but I believe it's important to have that vision. We do need yeah. to see change at all levels, but critically, the management level is just the wrong age for this kind of revolution, for all the reasons that Paul explained. So we have several approaches. Certainly, we have the early adopters and the younger employees leading the way, making the new way of working seem easy. We have a, a, a campaign of what we call reverse mentoring, where the younger employees mentor the older employees in new ways of working. But we also have to explain the rationale and the benefits mm -hmm. to that generation. And incentivize them to change. And so it does become an important campaign that encompasses not just top-down vision setting, not just bottom-up revolution, but engaging with, Paul, what you're calling the man, <laughs> engaging with the man, so the man wants to change. I think that the pressure is, is on the man, actually, because what we do know, if it's not integrated into the workflow and communications plan of your organization in an active way, that it will be done by guerrilla activity on sideband. And that will never be understood by the senior management. It actually creates a, an oppositional uh, culture. And you might want a little oppositional culture, but you don't want that much. <laughs> I agree, and I agree totally. Paul, uh, Robert, I'm going to uh, unmute Luis so he can speak. Um, if you would mind muting for, for during that period, no problem. 
Thanks, Charlie. Um, well, a couple of a couple of comments in there as well. Um, in my experience, no matter how powerful and how impressive the grassroots efforts are, if you don't have executive leadership and a sponsorship on what you're doing, they're going to eventually terminate it. And the reason why they're going to terminate it is not because they would want you to focus on the job, which they will, but what they want you to do is they don't want you to threaten their position of power. Absolutely. And eventually that's going to happen because at that point, information is going to flow freely amongst employees, something that management is always being very averse with, which is why we have got silos inside corporations in the first place. So one of the things that we did and we're trying to continue moving forward in that journey inside of IBM is breaking those silos needs to have a hybrid approach. Hybrid from bottom up, so you have all of those grassroots efforts of evangelists and people in the trenches walking the talk and doing it, and obviously that can take time, and, and that's fine. But also from the, top, from the top down to understand that if they don't get involved themselves, if they don't sort of like um, reframe the way they lead versus the way they manage, they will be left behind. Right. And and I'm and I'm you know I had a, a good giggle when when Paul was mentioning the man, the man right now doesn't check email and if he does he's wasting three four times three four hours per day of their precious time right and if you are going as those men it's actually usually the personal assistants the ones who are dealing with email, so and and my experience actually when I go and approach executives and and whatever the management layer, in terms of whether they would want to reduce their inbox clutter. The response that I get, not just from fellow IBM managers or whatever, but also from customers, is that they are the first ones who do not need email. They are the first ones who want to walk away from email. Right. It's just that we have actually fallen into that inertia of, well, you know, since it's email, let's all go and use email. That's what happens when new employees come into the company, especially young people. They all come with, you know, the same mentality that Paul mentioned on the charts, and that's absolutely right. But as soon as they see people older than them using email, they fall into that inertia and they just let them be absorbed by that. No, we shouldn't. We should actually look for more innovative ways on how we share and we collaborate. And it needs to have that hybrid approach of bottom-up and top-down so that people understand that this is not about how much you know or how much you hoard or protect your knowledge. This is about how much you can share with others so that you can help them become more effective at what they do. That's where we're shifting. That's the whole point behind all of these social business transformation or the social networking for business transformation where we start thinking more about how can I share what I know with people who I care for because I trust them. That's what it's all about, right? And, and Charlie mentioned to me as well about the use cases that I mentioned on, on my short pitch. Uh, I'm actually going to be sharing them on uh, something that we put together and Paul Jones along with um, Paul Lancaster and Alan Hamilton, uh, we are actually the four leaders of this community that I'm sharing now to all attendees on Google+, Plus, where we're helping and supporting everyone who wants to move away from inboxes with a whole bunch of various different techniques, reference links, experiences, presentations that we may have done, sharing what we have done as well with all the various different customers and business partners. And eventually, I will be sharing the use cases over there, as well as on my personal blog. But you guys probably will be able to find me that easily on, on Google.com. So if you want to go and keep up with those use cases, and we will be sharing those, that's where it was going to go. And if you want to go and, and join us on that community, by all means. Uh, the purpose that we have with that community is to help people understand how they themselves can really find their workplace. right? And, and that starts with having you know support groups, peer-to-peer -peer support networks that can help them understand how they can make the move. So essentially, we would need to have that hybrid approach in order to make it work. And, and if we don't have that hybrid approach, in my experience, what we will just have is just, again, another IT failure about to happen. Well, thank you very thank much, you very Luis. Much. We're going to have to wrap things up now. We're at 1.30, and uh, we appreciate everyone who attended this uh, webinar to spend one hour. Your time is very uh, precious and uh, limited. But I know for myself, and I hope uh, for the vast majority of the attendees, that the uh, remarks from Robert, Luis, and Paul were really inspirational. And uh, it certainly energized me to make a bigger effort to use social networking. Uh, the elephant to email uh, really slows me down, uh, as well as probably others during the day. Uh, I would like to, well, firstly, again, thank 
uh, Robert, Luis, and uh, Paul for joining us in this webinar and sharing their thoughts uh, with everyone in this uh, uh, webinar community. Uh, secondly, uh, IORG is having their third overloaded 2014 uh, one-day event in San Francisco again on Saturday, February 8th, 2014. We'll be making information available about this uh, fairly soon. I want to uh, make that aware to everyone. In addition to uh, our own IORG uh, homepage with some resources, we do, as you see on the, uh, the landing page for the webinar, have a information overload resources repository, which we welcome you to make contributions, come visit, and uh, see what's in there. Uh, it's only as good as the activity of all that uh, participate. So again, thank you on behalf of uh, IORG and our three panelists for joining us today. And we look forward to providing additional webinars of uh, this quality and interest to the community. Goodbye now.